Oh, I've already used this title format for my last video? Eh, I'm sure no one will notice. Indigo Park is the latest game in the ever-growing mascot horror genre, filled with yay, eh, and ooh. I've always had an eye on this project from afar, and assumed when it came out, I would mildly enjoy it. Then move on with my life. May 18th rolled around, and my expectations were completely blown out of the water. Kinda. Now, this is a newer title, so you might be wondering, what is an Indigo Park? One click to the Steam Store page fills us in on the context as we explore an abandoned childhood amusement park. We aren't exactly alone, as we're joined by an AI assistant named Rambly the Raccoon who guides us in restoring power to the destroyed park, while we, the player, avoid the reason it's shut down. I played this live when it came out, and after stream, I didn't exactly plan on making a video on it. As I let what I played settled in, however, I realized there's just so much I have to say. So many things this game makes me feel. I know it sounds cheesy, but playing Indigo Park brought me right back to the good old days of mascot horror, also known as 2017 through 2018. I was just a dumb child during this time, I accepted a lot of things. This indie horror is completely broken, great game! IGN sure is dumb for giving this great indie title a 4.1, am I right everyone? What makes Indigo Park so interesting to talk about though, is the fact I'm not a stupid kid anymore. I'm a stupid YouTuber who can tell the difference between good and bad. And I could safely say Indigo Park is filled with so much charm and personality. It all stems from Rambly the Raccoon, who turns this fairly basic mascot horror into something special. His design, animation, and voice puts a smile on my face. Oftentimes, it's annoying when there's a sequence you have to watch before being able to play the game, but Indigo Park is one of the rare cases where I don't care because Rambly is such a charming character that keeps you entertained. I love his and the rest of the characters that we get introduced to over the train ride. Why does it happen there? Well, because he likes trains. I usually don't like comparing, but I feel like it's a must for you guys to understand my point I'm about to make here, in that this section alone makes me completely understand who Rambling and the cast is, plus some of their relationships more than I ever did with the FNAF Security Breach characters. Does this exactly matter in a horror game? You can make the case it doesn't, though I love the little things like Rambly clearly having some sort of grudge against Lloyd the Lion. It shows me the developers put care into what I guess you can call the nice versions of these guys. Speaking of which, we might as well talk about the not nice versions. Starting with Lloyd, whose first introduction had me laughing because I thought he was doing the Family Guy death pose. His part and overall design didn't really leave much of an impact. There's a part here that looks perfect for something spooky to happen, but the only thing that happens is Lloyd jumps out, gets bonked, and then slides away. It's a little too silly for me to be scared of his other part where he actually attacks the player. A character that did leave a good impact was Molly McCall. I like both of her designs across both good and bad. She also has a good jump scare with great artwork for her game over screen. Those are the characters the first chapter decides to focus on, and overall it's pretty solid. That's something I can kinda say for the horror. I wasn't screaming or anything, but there are horror elements I can look at and go, yeah, that's a good attempt at a scare. Nothing crazy, yet nothing insulting. The best part is easily the chase sequence with Molly that takes place in a play structure that you can quickly get lost in. My only problem is that it would have been cool if the game somehow incorporated the fact that this character was a bird and can fly to get the player, but that's more of a wish than anything. And it would be hard to pull that off in such a tight area. The end chase sequence makes up for a missed opportunity where it seems like you're done for and BAM! If this was playing at a theater, I feel like it would be fair for the audience to stand up and start clapping. Okay, before anyone gets pissy, no, a horror game does not need gore in order to be considered automatically good. I'm just happy we're at a point where these mascot horror titles can try different things, where one title will have comedic edge to the horror, while another will gladly show its characters getting destroyed like a cherry kool-aid juice box. The best horror wasn't any of that though, it was actually the start of the game with the statue of the owner in Rambly. Moving around while looking at the owner, and, well, it's clear as day the face is following you, and it works in freaking me out. Also, I just like how the statue takes inspiration from Disneyland. The whole park in general takes a lot from Disneyland, for better and worse. On one hand, it's kinda cute seeing this area and going, hey, I recognize this area. On the other hand, for being a game where you're in an amusement park, there's nothing here that screams amusement park. As a whole, this chapter isn't much of a looker. You know, something's kinda bad if there was a point on my stream where I genuinely thought my default settings had the game graphics on low, only to find out I was on the epic settings. Yikes. I'm not the type of guy who will scream and cry if a game doesn't run at 4K with RTX and 120 FPS. 
but I will be the type of guy to look at a game and be able to tell you the graphics need some work. It isn't all bad. I thought Molly's landing pad was a neat environment, and of course I can't forget about the start of the game with the train. Alright, I didn't want to talk about the graphics or environment anymore. What we should cover now is the gameplay, which is kind of weird we're talking about this now. It is a game after all. I feel like that should have been one of the first things we talked about, so then why wasn't it? Well, it's because it isn't anything to write home about. You have a flashlight, never plays into anything, and kind of looks bad to be honest. You're given a critter cuff. It's a funny nod to Disneyland Magic Bands, but it's only ever used to open doors. One of the missions is literally you seeing a locked door, being told where the key is. You then have to walk all the way over there, then you get the key, and then you come back, and then that's kind of it. Nothing happens except a jump scare that you have a zero chance at dying or losing anything at. The best mission comes from this area I've probably shown a billion times in this video, where you go around the play area for a code. I can't help it if the game decides to make this area the best in terms of every category because it's fairly basic with missions that are only there to ease you into the game. That's the best mindset to have when going into this. If you were wanting this big new mascot horror that was going to change the world, then this isn't it. You might have wondered, or are wondering, why this video title describes the game as peak if the whole time I haven't been praising many elements of it. That's because I lied. Sorta. When I say Indigo Park is peak, I mean the series has peak potential, and I want to see it reach that. If you didn't like Indigo Park for not offering too much, that's completely fine, but at least try to see it like Bendy or Poppy Playtime. If we take away everything besides Chapter 1 of those two titles, can you say these are great games? I don't think so. Interesting setups? Absolutely. Setups that would get payoff. Bendy after the first game improved on everything with its sequel, Dark Revival. Poppy Playtime took its time, and we eventually got Chapter 3. These titles were well received by the majority of players, and it's because we saw the potential all the way back in their first chapters, even if they were pretty bare bones. Is it a shame we had to go through more of a prototype before getting an actual game with fleshed out concepts? Yeah. Then again, it's free. If this did cost money, I would be singing a different tune, but it's still good for what it is. If anything, I think it would be a smart move if Chapter 1 was used as a way to get eyes on the project for what they have so far, so that those who are interested can donate for Chapter 2, where it's then we do get a game that improves on itself. As it stands, Indigo Park has the character and charm down. It's a game I did enjoy at the end of the day, even if I'm more excited for what could come compared to what's already here. What I wish to see in a hypothetical sequel is more thought out gameplay, better visuals, and more interesting environments. I can't stress this enough though, I only want the best for this series. There is clear love and passion behind the project, and so I want to leave this video on a positive note to encourage you all to play it by uh, saying the secret arcade machine is really cool and I genuinely want that to become its own game, and uh, the credit song is also really good. If you haven't already, check out the game, again, it's free, I'll be linking both the Steam page for it and the Kickstarter in the description for those interested. The Kickstarter as of writing is at $32,000 and still needs $18,000 more for a sequel- oh never mind, it's reached its goal. Okay, see you guys for chapter 2!